Yes. Yes. yes, okay. So given um, Sue Wright's international reputation, her scholarship, her experience and her network, I'm positive that this, the chef will take off immediately and will become really an important player in global higher education or what I would call comparative higher education policy studies because I, it feels like you're going in this direction. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about what's going on in other places in higher education, but also to link higher education with secondary and general education and talk about trends. And because of that, I'm talking about the topic that has not reached yet Scandinavia and Denmark, the commercialization in education, but it is affecting, I'm sure, in one way or the other, higher education institutions and education in Scandinavia. And given your global outlook and, and comparative outlook, I thought it would be a good moment to address these kind of issues because it's relevant for both practitioners and policy makers and policy analysts. Uh, the reason why we are like in education, we are at the stage, we are beyond the stage noticing that the private sector is in education. I think the first generation talked and was surprised how McKinsey's, how uh, Gates Foundation, philanthropies, but also businesses starting with IBM in the 1970s are part of education. I think we are beyond that stage of just describing and noticing the fast advance. And we are moving towards analyzing why and how and with what impact. But just to give you one figure, there's one figure that Tony Berger, my colleague from Barcelona, wrote up in the um, uh, edited volume that we did together with Tony and Chris Lubinsky, just to show you how the global education market is expected to grow even further from 4.9 trillion globally to 6.3 million, with a big share in higher education. The, how is that so small? Uh, uh, it's, I think higher education is the green. Uh, it's either the green or the blue. But it is, <laughs> it is large. And um, similar to secondary education, and they have very similar traits. And the way I see it is that a higher education as has bought in first and is almost like the pioneer or pre-runner in the private sector for a variety of reasons. And these are two of them. The global talk on knowledge society is the one talk in which higher education reacted first before schools and other education institutions because it's supposed to contribute to knowledge society. And as a result of that talk, education is in all spheres. It is formal and non-formal education. There is a very strong belief in education and credentialism. I don't need to tell you this is object of higher education research. The boom in higher education that has taken place globally. And as part of that gloom, boom, the pressure towards credentialism and degrees. And as a result of this, in other countries and also in Europe, the whole issue, or I would say obsession, with quality assurance. In some countries, because the private sector moved in and the public higher education wanted to keep the gates or to regulate, at least, who is entering the market. At the same time, there is a talk also on lifelong learning, making stretching the age of people attending higher education in both directions. There is also uh, universities for children, but also uh, for higher education, allowing for more flexible ways of learning. So it is an education across the lifespan that affects higher education directly. But also, and this is coming up This is um, especially new in secondary schools or in general education. 
the advance of standards-based education. And all of you know PISA and international large-scale assessment. These are glo what we call global norm setters in education. OECD has become a global norm setter in national education and has impacted the way national policymakers do education. The other thing about education is that uh, we are dealing with loyal customers. In the school system, they stay with us for 12 years. And for businesses, this is a huge market because if they have their own way of developing tests, their own <coughs> textbooks, their own teachers, it is a recurrent clientele and it is a loyal uh, base of customers. Let me show you how I think how global higher education or the fact that actually higher education is the most transnational of all providers in education is pushing down its standards uh, to national secondary schools and primary and early childhood education that in many countries is local. We have in secondary schools this phenomenon of international standard schools. And I know that Fazal Rizvi worked for years on a project looking at cosmopolitanism and the belief in global citizenship and what this does to secondary schools and higher education. We have this phenomenon in many countries, including in Switzerland, where I grew up and where I am also based half of the year now, that parents would, if they had a choice, prefer to send their children to schools where they speak English and where they have a lot of technology. And they rather have this student mobility that you have now in higher education. They would love to have that also at the secondary school level. So what this does to national education system, as you can imagine, it's a threat. And it puts transnational or non-state actors at an advantage for providing schooling. Let me move on and show you beyond how higher education, this transnationalism that higher education is, already has, how this is impacting secondary and elementary. Let me also move up in the other direction and tell you how, show you a little bit how businesses have influenced public education in a negative way, and how this business thinking in public education has impacted the way we think about public education, how we design it, and how we provide it. And you will see that I left the right side, higher education sector, empty, hoping that we can maybe talk in small groups about commercialization or commercial mindsets in higher education. And let me just talk to you about the, how it manifests itself in the school sector. And maybe it applies, and maybe it does not apply to Denmark, but this is something open for discussion. So one of the things that we observe in public education is the production and delivery costs are reduced more and more. And the ones that started doing this are organizations such as Teach for All. And I think you have Teach for Denmark. Or there is talk about it? No? No, not yet? Teach for Denmark? So you have it already. So these are uh, providers, private providers, some, sometimes for profit, sometimes non, not for profit. Teach for All is not for profit, but the salary of the person who is running Teach for All is very big. It doesn't matter. It's still a nonprofit organization. Uh, so it's all about bringing down the qualification needed to become a professional teacher. My university, Columbia Teachers College, is the graduate school of education of Columbia University. So it's very much the DPU of the United States. It's also big. It's a think factory. It's a huge. We have. I think six or 7,000 students. We have 150 professors. We have had a huge crisis in teacher education programs because the state of New York and any other state 
had started to accredit and accept teacher degrees, teacher education degrees that are much cheaper than what we offer as Columbia University. Same with school principals training. So there's a trend towards shorter degrees and cheaper degrees and very bad for is that the state institutions that accredit those put them on equal footing or they put them on they put workplace education on equal footing so having had this trend together with the huge tuition problem that we have in the US and to, and to loan people say this is the next mortgage crisis in the United States this has really transformed higher education in the United States. So there's a big push in US higher education towards cheaper degrees and shorter degrees. And we are all encouraged. It used, it's like 20 years ago, that we were encouraged as faculty to develop distance education because it helped us to move beyond the boundaries of physical space. And now, we get all kinds of incentives from the administration to develop uh, shorter degree programs or certificate programs. So it has to do with the outside pressure coming from the private sector, at least in the United States, to, have, uh, to, to lower the qualification in the professions. Of course, I'm sure Sue Wright and others in higher education, they have analyzed that a zillion times. It is probably a vicious circle. I'm curious to see what you think. The more people go into higher education, the lower the requirements become. Uh, it becomes more and more uh, a professional degree. The second one, this is again, don't forget, it's in the school area. It's in secondary school. We are. Uh, we are experiencing a standardization of curricula, of tests, uh, of homogenization or standardization. And again, I can go into detail, PISA having, uh, moving away in national testing from whether students learn what they're supposed to learn and whether teachers teach what they're supposed to teach, which is the IEA type of study with teams and pearls and civic education, etc. We are moving towards PISA that measures 21st century skills, and it's the same in every country. So we have a really rapid globalization and standardization, not only of the test, but then as a result of that, also of the content. And I would think, again, Bologna and the standardization in higher education also opens opportunities for businesses, because businesses love big numbers. They can sell more of the same product to more countries, to more students, to more clients. So this is a, one of the transformations that I would expect uh, to come also in higher education. Then I talked about the establishing long-term services and sales contract. I'm, I'm on purpose speaking the language of business here. And actually, I'm quoting from a piece that I just wrote for the International Journal of Qual International Journal for Qualitative Studies in Education. And there's a special issue with three colleagues from DPU. That's why I thought it's an opportune moment. Katja Broger, John Chrysler, and Dorothy Downes are the co-editors. So this is something that we have in the education system. And you probably will experience it strongly also, that it's all connected. The qualification of the teacher or the instructor or the professor is linked to the material or the modules that are produced uh, to the tests. The last two I will comment on is this phenomenon of introducing the fee structure. Uh, the idea that the core curriculum is for free and everything is added. Every additional service is added. This is a new phenomenon that is spreading rapidly in education. And the other phenomenon is the tendency to scandalize public education to say how poorly it's doing. The same with universities, how poorly public education are doing. 
in order for the private sector to come in as a major player. Let me say something about introducing a fee structure. One example is from a book chapters, book chapter that, that Natasha Rich and her associates have written in the most recent handbook of the World Yearbook of Education. They're bringing the example of games, which is a private sector, it's a private business. They're global. And what they're saying is, proudly, we developed the airline model of economy, business, and first class in education to make top-notch education available based on what families can afford. And in effect, what it's a conglomerate uh, of schools. It's huge. It's operating in many countries. So they are within the same countries, in this case in the Emirates, developed first class schools, business class schools, and economy class schools. So when you look at this is the tuition varies from $2,000 per year to 22000 If you, as parent, afford to pay the highest tuition fee, the teachers you get for your children are from the UK. Uh, and and um, no, no, I'm sh yeah, are from the UK, and they are among American and Canadian. The largest number of teachers is from uh, are from from the UK, but also from the US and Canada. Let's come to the economy class. If you can only afford two thousand, you will have teachers that are either Pakistani or from non-Gulf Arab countries. And also the facilities that your children have access to vary from whether you have access to the sports facilities, to the swimming pool, to labs, etc. So in education, this is for us a relatively new phenomenon, and we are shocked. But in higher education, in many countries, and again, I don't think that's the case in Denmark, this is a reality in the United States and in many countries. We have already, based on the tuition that students pay, first-class universities, or world-class universities, you would call, some would call them, or business class or economy class. So I sh have two minutes left. This is the issue of inequality that is really felt also in higher education. Let me f finish with this slide on the fifth business strategy in education, but also in higher education in many countries, is to scandalize or criticize public education in an attempt to then open up opportunities for the private sector to come in. The economist who is, speaks to financial financially oriented individuals is very strong on reporting on higher education and schools. And that's a relatively new phenomenon. And one of the things it's always bringing up is how poorly education is doing. And as you know, Pearson is one of the companies that is a global <laughs> education industry. And they have joined forces with OECD for the next cycle to develop tests. So we will see much more coming much more critique of public higher education. And that's why a center like CHEF is really crucial to analyze the transformation of public higher education, given this environment where the private sector is really trying to push in and come in and turn public education into a very lucrative business. I think I should end here. And again, wish you all the best, Sue. And I'm sure you will manage to build an amazing center.